I V M. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way. into the dreary desert sand of dead habit where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action into that heaven of freedom my father let my country awake welcome to the pragati podcast i'm your host hamsani hariharan every week my co-host pavan shrinath and i get together to discuss economics public policy and international relations to all our listeners we wish you a very happy independence day it's been 71 years since india made a tryst with destiny but if you listen to debates around the country you'll see a lot of despair about the indian nation and its future if you go by the definition of a nation it's an imagined community in the words of benedict anderson So for this special Independence Day episode we wanted to do something different. We posed four questions to two guests. The first is Nitin Pai the director of the Takshashila Institution. Our second guest is Dr. Akash Singh Rathore who is the director of the International Research Network for Religion and Democracy and was formerly a visiting professor at the Center for Philosophy Jawaharlal Nehru University. Our questions to Akash were part of a larger episode on Swaraj that will be released next week. What we wanted to know from our two guests was essentially this. In these polarized times, what is nationalism? Would they consider themselves nationalist? We also wanted to look back at the last 71 years. How far have we come? And finally, we looked to the future. What gives us hope? What gives us despair about the state of our nation? all of this on today's episode of the pragati podcast but first a short break so it's been another great week on ivm podcast if you're not following us on social media please do we're ivm podcast on twitter facebook and instagram last week we launched a new podcast called the kinetic living podcast with urmi kothari it's a show about keeping fit both physically and mentally listen to her conversation with some of the most interesting people and how they went on their fitness journeys On Cyrus says this week Cyrus speaks to Nihal Mariwala co-founder of Seto India. They speak about health culture in this country. On Kolaba Cartel I'm joined by Gauri Jay Abhishek and Sumit who reveal how they came up with the concept for the new restaurant Misty. On Geek Fruit this week Tejas and Dinkar discuss all things in pop culture that are so bad they're hilariously good. This week on Shunya One Sheila Ditya speaks to Nitya Sharma from Simple. That's the sign you see every time you have to enter the OTP for your payments on the apps that you use. On the scene in the unseen Amit Verma speaks to journalist and China expert Manoj Kevarulmani to dissect China's foreign policy and its impact on India. And uh, with that let's continue with your show. Welcome back to the special Independence Day episode at the Pragati podcast. We have two guests today, Dr. Akash Singh Rathore and Nitin Pai, and we're asking them four questions each about the Indian nation. Let's begin. Akash, what does nationalism mean to you? Well, it, it it means something to me, and it means something for me because I'm both uh, uh, a person who belongs to the nation, but I'm also a scholar who works on the topic of nationalism. So, it's always easier for a, a scholar to distance himself a little bit from it and talk about what it means for me. But hopefully, I'll develop the courage also to say <laughs> what it means to me. So, there's a a long-standing and very important history of philosophical and political thought about nationalism do we even need it and uh in india it goes back even to the the conversations of various freedom fighters themselves tagore and gandhi had a very significant debate on this issue where tagore's position was i'm not even sure that we're going in the right direction on this the thing that i think captures it most which maybe gets to the question of what it means to me is in garibare the translated as at home in the world so what this novel uh, does is it it starts to understand the relationship that an an individual has in participating in a national movement what does it mean is there a conflict between 
what your values are, what you're attempting to achieve through a nationalist movement, and who you really are. So do we alter ourselves to conform to a conception of the nation? And Tagore was extremely concerned that, yes, indeed, we do. And violence is the inevitable result, kind of authoritarian ideology and so on. So that, in a way, reflects also my own concerns. Nationalism means, to me as a scholar, a significant area of political and philosophical importance. But as a as a citizen or as a person, uh, we see this playing out in all sorts of ways. So I've been teaching at JNU, the anti-national university of India, right? This is declared like like this. My experience with the majority of the students at JNU is that they regard themselves they won't use the word nationalist because that has a certain color, but they regard themselves as out and out patriots. So, um, so it becomes very personal, very interesting. Nitin, what do you understand by nationalism? What does it mean to you? Nationalism is the idea that a bunch of people who share a common bond constitute a political unit and therefore they have certain rights. Now, these rights could be this right to self-determination, which means uh, a bunch of people who have uh, common bonds get to form their own political organization called a state and run their own affairs. It could also mean that uh, on a less political level, it could mean that uh, uh, a bunch of people who have common bonds have certain rights uh, as, a, as a group of people that need to be respected. Now, the ugly form where it can take is when uh, this uh, groupism is directed in a way that is us versus them. So our group is this great group which has been wronged and has a set of grievances and their group is this lesser group which has been oppressing us and therefore uh, this whole business of nationalism is a struggle between us and them. Hmm. So would you consider yourself a nationalist? I would consider myself a nationalist uh, in the Indian sense because the way Indian nationalism has evolved uh, in comparison to how it's evolved in Europe, for example, is that it has always been liberal in nature. It has always had a pluralist bent that respected diversity and it also always had a social reform bent. So Indian nationalists were acutely aware that we live in a very diverse country uh, pluralism is default and there are deep inequities in terms of social relations, in terms of the caste system, in terms of gender and so forth. And Indian nationalists from the late 1890s have been very conscious of this fact and the attempt has been to transcend these things and solve these problems. So Indian nationalism has essentially been liberal in nature, although there have been illiberal forms of nationalism in India. But Indian nationalism uh, the kind of nationalism that you saw, which informed the freedom struggle, for example, has been plural, has been respectful of diversity, has been open-minded, has been sensitive to the need for social reform. And therefore, I would call it a liberal nationalist uh, sentiment. And I think that's a wonderful uh, set of emotions, a wonderful set of sentiments, and a wonderful set of values to organize the future of India. Because every society needs a set of values around which it organizes itself. And liberal nationalism, the kind that came down to us from the freedom movement, presents us with, still with, presents us with one of the best formulas to organize our life and country around. We asked Akash the same question and he had a one-line response. Yeah, I very strongly consider myself a nationalist. The question is, would you consider me a nationalist? <laughs> <laughs> so how far do you think we've come since we got independence 71 years ago? Yes, I think uh, we've come uh, very far. This is a little complicated because you know when when people like um, Ambedkar, Ambedkar was one of the greatest champions for universal suffrage. When he begins discussing universal suffrage, universal suffrage was not a new thing for India. It was a new thing for the world, right? There were very few countries that conceived of this. So India positioned itself when they accepted Ambedkar's idea of universal suffrage for the eventual what they called Swaraj constitution. The India positioned itself as a thought leader among all nations, not just as a decolonizing you know, colony that is trying to eke out its freedom, but as a thought leader for all nations. Part of why Gandhi rejected the permanent seat at the 
the the the uh, in the in the UN because we're setting new paradigms for the world, not these these old ones. If you gauge from that metric, we haven't come very far. This is a conundrum. If you gauge from that metric, but if you gauge from actual delivery of services to masses of people who are excluded, not just post-independence India, but always excluded, then we've come very, very far away. So someone like me who has an ambiguous relationship with the, <coughs> with the administrative state, something I find very frustrating and bureaucratization, debilitating bureaucratization and so on. From my advantage point of view, uh, I would really like to get rid of the state, you know, for all of its interference. But then think about the people who finally have water after centuries, who finally have, uh, uh, you know, consistent sustenance, who finally have education, who finally have literacy. None of that would have been possible without our elephantine state, which creates such a headache for, for people like me. So there are different ways to look at it. In some ways, in terms of what our thought leaders propounded, we have come nowhere near the, our own predictions of what Swaraj means in 1920. In some ways, for the reality on the ground, for people who have been excluded from any government, British, whether whether imperial, colonial, feudal, you know, any, from them, we've come light years forward. You know, for them, we've come light years forward. So it's, it's a bit uh, mixed, I think, but one should always watch one's class position and caste position and so on when pontificating on how far we've come because each of us have come a different distance and some of us, thanks to the state, have come very light years ahead. I think we've had multiple generations uh, that have experienced uh, life in independent India. I think the first generation of people who were born before independence prized independence and the fact that we are running our own country as something greatly valuable because they had seen life under the British uh, Raj. The middle generation lived most of its life under the pressures of socialism where things were scarce, where the hand of government was strong. They lived through the emergency, for example, where free, essential liberties were taken away. So they had a more, uh, I would think, cynical a beginning to have a cynical approach towards what India is about because they spent most of their life uh, in a country where it was hard to get a telephone line. It was hard to get a scooter. It was hard to, you know, buying a car would have been unimaginable for that generation. I think the post-92 generation has grown up oblivious to what happened in the past um, because information exploded, opportunities exploded, and the ability to reflect on India's post-independence in, uh, history was so limited that we've all grown up uh, without knowing what happened in the past. And we take a lot of things for granted. So over this three generations, if I were to oversimplify it, I think the first generation had a lot more of idealism and aspiration. The second generation lived through a period of deprivation and became a little cynical. The third generation saw opportunity, saw itself as exposed to the, uh, to the world as at large, but was still unsure of what it is are the foundations of the country and the society that we live in. I think that's the moment I think we find ourselves in today. What's past is prologue, right? <laughs> Looking to the future, Nitin, what gives you hope? What gives you despair? Well, the reason to be pessimistic is that the whole... Large parts of the country seem to have, large parts of the country, people in large parts of the country seem to have withdrawn into a very selfish se shell where what matters is me, my family, uh, my community, and maybe my political, ideological group. It seems to be very insensitive to people who are not like us. It seems to be very insensitive to the public space. Uh, for example, would we invest in public libraries? Uh, would we invest in gardens? Would we invest in open spaces where people from all walks of life can converge? I think these seem to be very minor priorities for people and people with means. 
Now, they might it might look innocuous. Why do you need a public library, right? But a public library is a place where people who do not have access to books, do, cannot afford to buy books or read books, can come uh, and and read and enrich themselves. It's also a place where people from different walks of life can can meet. Uh, so in that sense, it's a civic space. It's a public space that every society needs to have. And we don't invest in these spaces anymore. It's just an overall manifestation of what I talked about in the sense that we've withdrawn ourselves into shells and we see everything in terms of us versus them and the them could be anybody else. And I've written about coercive majoritarianism where the, if the us is a large group of people, then we feel that we can impose our mores, our values, our norms on people who are not like us and our politics on people who are not like us. I think that's the cause for concern. What's the cause for hope? I think the moorings that we have, uh, historical moorings in terms of the pluralist tradition that we've had, uh, in terms of historical moorings, in terms of the values of independent India, they're still with us. The Republic of India, as uh, informed and as managed by the Constitution of India, is still with us. So it gives us a much better platform in order to reorganize our future than anybody else has in the world. So... The challenge for us is to be able to use these instruments like the Constitution of India, the, the, the liberal ethos that we have in the country, the civilizational space, which is, which stands for pluralism, diversity that we've inherited for centuries, uh, is a platform that we can build upon. The challenge is for us to be able to build upon that platform. That's it for our show today. We hope you spend not only the rest of the day or the week but the whole year thinking of these questions. And if you have found satisfactory answers to them, do send us your answers on Twitter. Our handles are at Humsini H and at Zeus is Dead. You can also mail your comments and questions to podcast at thinkpragati.com. You can listen to the Pragati podcast on the IBM podcast app or wherever you get your podcast from. We're there everywhere. Hello, I'm Chuck. I'm Shrikit. And I'm Narain. And together, we are the hosts of the podcast, Simplified. Simplified. And we are going to be doing a 100th episode. Ba-ba-ba-ba. Which is going to be a live episode at Dulali in Khar in Mumbai on the 25th of August 2018. Yes, we should get the year right. So we're going to be doing a lot of fun things at the show. We are going to be talking about some stuff, simplifying them. We're going to have a very erudite guest who's going to hopefully make up for our silliness, but we sincerely doubt it. And there's definitely going to be a lot of beer, so we really hope you join us. It'll be fun and it'll be more fun if you guys are there. So do land up. See you. Bye-bye. Some time ago, five successful restauranteurs came together to form the Kolaba Cartel. The founders of the table, Gauri Devi Dayal and Jay Yusuf, partnered with the founders of Woodside Inn, Abhishek Honawar, Pankil Shah and Sumit Gambhir to open a new restaurant in Kolaba. If you've ever dreamed of opening a restaurant or love eating out, you want to listen in. The Kolaba Cartel. This exclusive 10 part series is hosted by Gauri Devi Dayal and Amit Doshi. Catch new episodes of The Kolaba Cartel every Monday and Thursday on the IVM Podcasts app, website, or wherever you get your podcasts.